good evening everyone i am saurabh paliwal from biocons investor relations team and i would like to welcome you today to today's earnings call for the fourth quarter and full year fiscal 2024 i would like to indicate that all participants are in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the opening remarks conclude should you need to ask questions please raise please select the raise hand option under the reactions tab of your zoom application you will call out your name and unmute your line to enable you to ask the question while asking please begin with your name and your organization please note that the chat box is disabled but you can raise any technical concerns by sending us an email to investor@relations@biocon.com i would like to bring to your attention that this conference is being recorded the recording will be made available on our website within a day and the transcript will be made available subsequently as part of today's representation we have group ceo mr peter bains mr sadhav mittal ceo and md of biocon limited mr shiha stambe ceo and md of biocon biologics limited along with other senior management colleagues from across the business segments to discuss this quarter's business performance and future outlook for the company before we begin i would like to remind everyone regarding the safe harbor link to this conference call comments made during the call may be forward looking in nature based on management's current beliefs and expectations they must be viewed in relation to the risks that our business faces that could cause our future results performance or achievements to differ significantly from what is expressed or implied by such forward looking statements after the end of this call if you need any further information or clarifications to get in touch with us with this i would like to turn the call over to mr peter bains our group ceo for his opening remarks over to you peter thank you sarab and good evening everyone and thank you for participating in this review of biocon group's fiscal 24 quarterly and full year financial results before presenting the results in detail i'd like to start with some opening remarks overall 24 has been a year of balanced progress in which each of biocon's three core business verticals biocon generics biocon biologics and syngene have delivered significant operational successes and made clear advances in preparation for future growth while at the same time facing and addressing a range of operational challenges overall the balance and momentum has been positive let me now expand a little on each of the verticals and start with our generics business on the generics front we have seen encouraging growth in our formulations business expansion driven by new product launches strengthening of our us business footprint and further traction in our wider geographic expansion initiatives through both our direct to market and strategic partnerships model momentum in our formulations business balanced the challenges we faced in pricing pressures on our api business which witnessed the contraction over the year resulting in generics delivering a modest 1% year on year growth we were very pleased with our recent landmark success in our peptide portfolio through securing approval for liraglutide a glp1 receptor agonist prescribed for diabetes as well as obesity in the uk this was the first generic approval of a glp in a major regulated market represented another first for biocon and also represented a clear signal of our capability in development and manufacturing of complex glp drug device products turning now to our biosimilars business where during this fiscal and in what has been a transformational year we completed the full transition of the acquired biosimilar business globally we maintained strong revenue growth momentum delivering robust volume growth evidenced by improvement in market shares of our products in all regions especially in the united states and we expanded our geographical reach accessing new markets and patients and cross the 1 billion dollar revenue threshold all in all this was a, a hugely eventful start to the new post acquisition biocon biologics era 
Along with our peers, we faced inertia in the formulation of the biosimilar adalimumab market in the United States, which we do not see materially opening until calendar year 25. During the year, we prepaid $250 million of acquisition-related balance sheet debt, and as stated in earlier calls, reducing debt will remain a management priority. Moving on to Sinjin, Sinjin delivered a 9% year-on-year revenue growth while absorbing a research services sector-wide funding slowdown in the fourth quarter. Sinjin's rapidly evolving contract research, development, and manufacturing platform provided revenue diversification to offs offset what is already expected to be a transitory slowdown in research funding with its development and manufacturing divisions, especially biomanufacturing, delivering a strong performance. All three of Biocon Group's major business segments are at exciting inflection points and are developing improved positions for growth opportunity in the near term and beyond. I'll now move on to present the key financials. And turning now to the financial highlights, I'll start with quarter four. Here at group level, total revenue for the quarter was 3,966 school, up 1% year on year. Revenue from operations at 3,917 crore came in slightly more strongly, up 4%. At the verticals level, biosimilars revenue from operations grew a robust 12% year on year, while research services and generics saw sequential growths of 2% and 7% respectively. I'll elaborate more on this uh, later in my remarks. Group core EBITDA for the quarter stood at 1,176 score, representing a core operating margin of 30%. Quarterly R&D spend stood at 246 score, corresponding to 8% of revenues excluding Sinji. EBITDA for the quarter stood at 964 crore with a margin of 24%, with profit before tax and exceptional items stood at 328 crore versus 500 last year. Net profit for the quarter, excluding exceptional items, stood at 144 crore versus 335 last uh, fiscal last quarter. Reported net profit for the quarter was 136 crore. Now, if I move on to the full year and uh, start with those numbers, in fiscal 24, total revenues at the group level came in at 15,621 crore, a growth of 35% year on year. Total revenues included 530 crore of stake dilution and fair valuation gain in Baikara, pursuant to their December fundraise, and an operating income of 350 crore from the divestment of the two non-core business units in India to Iris Life Science by Biocon Biologics in Q3. The biologic segment contributed the bulk of the full year growth with operating revenues growing 58% to 8,824 crore. The research services segment grew by 9% to 3,489 crore, while generics came in with 1% growth at 2,799 crore. Group core EBITDA was up 10% to 4,195 crore, representing a core operating margin of 29%. R&D investment for the full year were 1,154 crore, up 3% year on year, and representing 10% of revenues, excluding Sinji. EBITDA for the year was up 44% at 4,164 crore versus 2,888 crore in the same period last year, with an EBITDA margin of 27%. Adjusting for the step-up gain in Baikara and the Iris transaction, EBITDA would stand at 3,284 crore with an EBITDA margin of 22%. Profit before tax and exceptional items stood at 1,537 crore, up 29% year-on-year, 
with net profit for the year before exceptional items coming in at 1,030 crore versus 787 in fiscal 23, up 31% year on year. For the full year, exceptional items amounted to 8 crore net of tax and minority interests compared to 324 crore last fiscal. Consequently, reported net profit after exceptional items for fiscal 24 is 1,022 crore versus 463 last fiscal. Let me now turn to the segmental uh, business performance during the quarter. And let me start with the performance for generics. In Q4, the generic segment reported an operating revenue of 719 crore, a 3% decline year over year, but a sequential quarterly growth of 2%. Core EBITDA for the quarter was 155 crore, representing a margin of 21%. Profit before tax stood at 50 crore, uh, and on a full year basis, generics recorded an operating revenue of 2,799 crore, up 1% year on year. Core EBITDA was 627 crore, flat versus last year, with a margin of 22%. Profit before tax stood at 234 crore, with a profit before tax margin of 8%. Overall, the full year generics performance came in below expectations due to pricing and demand challenges in the API business, as well as the impact of some regulatory delays. Notwithstanding this, we are very pleased with the tractions that we've seen in the formulations business, which grew 36% year on year, reflecting the investments we've made in building our formulations capabilities, capacities, and product range over the past few years. Statin and immunosuppressant formulations led the, the growth momentum, which was also seen across all major geographies. During the fiscal formulation share of product sales increased to approximately 35% from 25% last year, and it is, it is expected to increase and overtake APIs as a share of our business mix in the coming years. It's also important to note that despite the challenges faced in our API business, we were able to maintain core EBITDA margins at the same levels as last year due to cost control and saving initiatives. On the regulatory front, the approval for our generic liraglutide in the UK was a notable highlight, with Biocon becoming the first company globally to receive a generic GLP approval in a major regulated market. This approval is not only important as a step towards entry into the UK market ex itself, but also reinforces our technical and development capabilities in bringing complex GLP drug device products to the market. This augurs well for Biocom's ability to access and capture future GLP opportunities that will be a major driver of growth momentum in the coming years as we develop and look to bring to market our extensive pipeline of GLP products, products across global markets. Over the full year, we made filings for 38 drug products and 37 APIs and received approvals for 24 products and 20 APIs across global markets. I'm also pleased to report that during the year, we had multiple facility inspections from international regula regulatory agencies across various sites, all with positive outcomes. On the manufacturing front in, in fiscal 24, we continued our focus on enhancing our capacities and capabilities to support ongoing and future growth, particularly in formulations and peptides. To strengthen our foothold in the North American market, Biocon acquired an oral solid dosage US manufacturing facility located in New Jersey. The acquisition of this FDA approved facility, our first in the United States, will strategically enhance and complement Biocon's existing manufacturing capabilities and is expected to be begin commercial operations in fiscal 25, subject to regulatory clearance. 
In India, our immunosuppressant facility in Vizag received a Certificate of Suitability, or CEP, from the European regulator, EDQM. We expect the facility to be inspected and subsequently qualified for commercial supplies by other major regulators uh, during this fiscal. Our peptide facility in Bengaluru also successfully completed process validation activities, a very important step in preparation for future product launches. Enhancements to our synthetic cap uh, capacities in Hyderabad, non-immunofermentation capacities, as well as new sterile injectables uh, in our facility in Bengaluru remain on track. We are continuing to expand our product pipeline with a clear focus on formulations and peptides to cater for our mid and longer term business uh, opportunities and requirements. Coming to leadership updates in the generic business, I'm very pleased to announce the appointment of Vishal Neha as head of supply chain management and Amit Captain as head of commercial for our global API business, as well as for generic formulations in select emerging markets. Overall, and despite the revenues coming in slightly below expectations to the pricing pressures in the API business, fiscal 24 has been a year of important progress for the generic segment with strong momentum in the formulations business, strength and footprint and capabilities in the United States, enhanced reach and partnerships across global markets, and a key first registration in our GLP market ambitions. As we look ahead, formulations are expected to be the key growth driver for fiscal 25, and we would expect performance to build throughout the year with a stronger second half pull through. Our GLP portfolio, including liraglutide, semaglutide, and tazepatide, is expected to play a major role in the mid to longer term. We see GLPs as the major growth driver of the business from fiscal 26 onwards. Market data here indicate the market opportunity of GLPs to reach nearly $100 million by the end of this decade. And we have a comprehensive pipeline to address and compete in this major strategic market opportunity. Turning now to the biosimilars uh, segment, let me start by providing an update on quarter four's uh, business performance. With the full transition of the acquired Viatris business successfully completed in December 23, fully one year ahead of schedule, this was the first quarter where Biocon Biologics directly managed the fully integrated business across all geographies globally. We have been able to achieve this while ensuring a seamless experience for our patients, our customers, and our partners, and at the same time, maintaining significant in-market growth momentum. A clear highlight for the quarter has been the performance in the United States, where only two quarter, quarters post-transition, we can report strong demand and enhanced market share performance across all our commercial products. Fulfiller, our biosimilar peg Filgrastin, increased its market share to 21% from 14% in March 23, and was the only product in the category increasing market share. Ogivri, our biosimilar trastuzumab, increased share to 18% from 10% last March and is seeing increased pull through at the physician level. We have also secured four new commercial formula agreements, including United Healthcare's commercial medical benefit drug policy, effective um, 1st of May this year as a United Healthcare preferred oncology product. Our assembly and insulin glargine franchise has increased its share to 15% and is the fastest growing brand in the segment. As you are aware, IQVIA reported share does not include closed door networks, which would add an estimated 3% additional market share. Overall, the continued momentum of market share performance of our biologics products in the United States since transition has been very encouraging and positions as well as the market dynamics continue to evolve in the US private and government sectors. 
I'd now like to comment briefly on our biosimilar Adelimumab franchise. Adelimumab has been a significant success for our biologics business in our, in our portfolio, and our franchise in Europe has been very successful and continues to be a key value and growth driver for us. We've earned market shares of 20% in Belgium, 18% in Germany, and 11% in France, which reflects the strong confidence patients and prescribers have in our products since we launched in 2018. In the US, as you will all know, the biosimilar adalimumab market formation has emerged significantly slower than anyone had anticipated. As previously advised, we think that while the market will begin to open in calendar 24, it will not really develop fully until calendar 25, as formularies start excluding the originator and biosimilars secure exclusive or preferred coverage. Bicon Biologics intends to leverage its relationships with US customers and PBMs to pursue opportunities across all channels, but expects that this will take some time to fully fructify and translate into sales. Turning now to Europe, we're pleased to report that our market shares have re remained robust and stable across all major markets in the first quarter after completing full transition in December. Fulfiller held 8% share, Ogrevy 10% share, and Abevmi, uh, biosimilar Bevisuzumab, remained at 6% at the end of December 23. We are also seeing significant success in capturing new market opportunities and expanding reach into the top five European countries. In, on the emerging markets front, Biocom Biologics posted its highest ever quarter revenue, led by strong growth across its major regions in LATAM, Latin America, Africa, the Middle East and Turkey, and the Asia Pacific regions. Revenues were driven by the consolidation of the self-led and the partner-led business models and supported by seven product launches during the quarter. We have seen strong demand for our recently launched biosimilar Bevacizumab in Brazil, and we've expanded patient reach in Mexico with additional insulin supplies to our partner there to address the unmet needs of insulin-dependent patients grappling with market shortages of insulins. Turning now to the IRIS transaction, as we've previously announced, Biocon Biologics entered a long-term commercial collaboration with IRIS Life Sciences to expand access to our portfolio of metabolics, oncology, and critical care products in India. This was for a total transaction value of 1,242 crore, representing a value accretive multiple of 3.4 times revenues and 18 times EBITDA. This strategic collaboration with IRIS aligns with Biocon Biologics' commercial strategy to maximize patient reach and market potential while unlocking value from its branded formulations business in India, built up over the past two decades. We've also signed a 10-year supply agreement with IRIS for these products as part of the collaboration. Turning now to the full year of financial update for, for biosimilars, revenue from operations was 2,358 crore, up 12% year on year. Excluding the one-time 354 crore income from the divestment of the two non-core business units in India to IRIS in Q3, this would have translated into sequential growth of 10%. Core EBITDA was 698 crore with a margin of 30%. EBITDA margin for the quarter were 24% with R&D investments at 7% of revenues. On a full year basis, Biocon Biologics crossed the US dollar 1 billion revenue mark with revenue from operations at 8,824 crore, representing a 58% year on year growth driven by the step up from the acquisition, along with robust underlying growth in the core businesses. The business delivered 2,190 crore in EBITDA, representing a healthy margin of 25%.
We also continue to invest in our pipeline to support future growth with an R&D spend at 10% of revenues. You would also have noticed a reduction in operating expenses versus Q3 in fiscal 24, reflecting the decrease in costs linked to the integration and one-time related costs. Reducing our acquisition debt remains a key priority. And as I mentioned, we were able to allocate $250 million of, um, to this end over the full year. Turning now to regulatory updates on the biosimilars front, we're very pleased to share that the US FDA has accepted our biologics license application for biosimilar Ustekinumab for review under the 351K pathway. And we've signed a settlement and license agreement with Janssen Biotech and Johnson & Johnson that clears the way to commercialize the product uh, in the US subject to regulatory approval no later than February the 22nd, 2025. This now positions us to be amongst the first wave of entrance into the US market. Biocon Biologics has also signed a settlement agreement with Bayer and Regeneron that paves the way for the introduction of Yesophily, our biosimilar Aflibicept, into the Canadian market no later than July 25. The product has already been approved by Health Canada. Also on the regulatory front, the FDA was unable to undertake an inspection of our Bengaluru facility that manufactures our biosimilar Bevacizumab within the initially proposed goal date timeline and therefore issued a supplementary CRL. The CRL did not identify any outstanding scientific issues and we have submitted all required documentation to the agency. Turning to our Malaysia site, here we have completed the implementation of all the corrective and preventative actions, the CAPAs, as per the committed timelines and, and have provided the US FDA with a comprehensive update. As a next step, we are now anticipating the agency to visit and to inspect both the Bengaluru and Malaysia sites, which subject to outcome would pave the way for approval of our biosimilar ASPART from uh, our Malaysia site and our biosimilar Bevacuzumab from our Indian site. It is important to note that the same facilities are already CGMP certified by leading global regulators, including the EME, EMA and Health Canada. With uh, regard to biosimilars leadership updates, uh, delighted to announce the appointment of Dwight Hanshu as its new chief quality officer uh, this quarter. Dwight brings um, with him over 30 years of global leadership experience and expertise across operations, quality and R&D. And most recently, he was the head of quality for CIPLA in the United States. In summary, fiscal 24 has been a truly transformative year for Biocon Biologics, with the company emerging as a unique, fully integrated and leading global biosimilars player. The business delivered strong in-market performance, crossing the 1 billion revenue threshold, grew share in all its products in the key US market, had its highest ever quarterly sales in emerging markets, while simultaneously maintaining business continuity and integrating a highly complex, geographically diverse business across 120 countries one year ahead of schedule. Looking ahead, we will consolidate and strengthen our focus on leveraging the advantages of our fully integrated model to accelerate growth for existing products and continue to expand our geographical footprint. Preparing for new product launches will also be a major focus. A flow of new product launches is now on the horizon, and these new launches will be key catalysts in the near to medium term to drive both sustainable growth and margins. Behind this, we will continue to invest in advancing and building a highly competitive um, global pipeline and expect R&D investments to be in the 8 to 9% of revenues range. Let me now give a brief update on our novel molecules. Um, 
Uh, these are novel assets targeting autoimmune disease and cancer. Let me start with italizumab, a first-in-class novel anti-CD6 monoclonal antibody licensed to Equilium for certain markets. Italizumab is being developed by Equilium for acute graft versus host disease and for systemic lupus erythematosus and lupus nephritis. During the fiscal, Equilium presented positive data from phase 1b equalized study of etolimuzumab in patients with lupus nephritis at the annual meetings of the American Society of Nephrology and the American College of Rheumatology. In April, it also announced positive top-line data from a phase 1 equalized study in patients with lupus nephritis where the study demonstrated clinically meaningful response in highly proteinuric patients with more than 80% of subjects achieving over a 50% reduction in urine protein uh, creatinine ratio. Itolimuzumab also demonstrated a favorable safety and tolerability profile. Equilium has entered into an option and asset purchase agreement with Japan's Ono Pharmaceuticals granting them an exclusive option to acquire Equilium's rights for Japan. Their option is expected in the second half of calendar 24. Boston-based Bicara Therapeutics is developing BCA-101, a first-in-class EGFR TGF beta trap bifunctional antibody. During the fiscal, Bicara presented positive interim data from its ongoing open-label phase 1 and 1b dose expansion study of BCA-101 at the European Society for Medical Oncology, evoking strong investor and investigator interest. In 2023, Bicara closed a Series C funding of $165 million dollars uh, and post this fundraise, Biocon shareholding in Bicara has now diluted to 14%, and the company is con no longer considered an associate company of the Biocon group. Let me now turn to Syngene, our research services segment. Syngene's fourth quarter revenue from operations was 917 core, a growth of 7% on a sequential basis, degrowing 8% year over year. For the full year, revenue was up 9% over um, fiscal 23 to 3,489 crore. Revenue performance during Q4 and the full year was impacted by lower demand for research services, stemming from a reduced capital fund, uh, funding environment in the United States. On a full year basis, Syngene delivered 9% year-on-year growth with reported EBITDA growing 10%, to 1,105 crores with stable EBITDA margins at 31%. Profit before tax was 632 crores and up 6% year on year. This performance was underpinned by Syngene's diverse business platform with its development and manufacturing services, especially in biomanufacturing, delivering strong growth throughout the year and more than compensating for the slowdown in research revenues. During the year, Syngene successfully concluded the acquisition of a strategic biologics manufacturing facility from Stellis Biopharma, which will add 20,000 liters of manufacturing capacity, trebling Syngene's biomanufacturing capacity and providing the basis for future growth opportunity. The completion of the facility, uh, its modifications and qualification remain on track and are expected in the second half of fiscal 25. Sinjin also acquired 17 acres of land in Genome Valley in Hyderabad to support long-term growth in the research services um, division. The recent step up now seen in new funding in the US biotech is encouraging and is, is expected to drive a recovery in demand for research services and development services in the coming quarters. Sinjin's guidance for fiscal 25 includes revenue growth at single digit to low double digits on a constant currency basis, operating EBITDA margin to be similar to fiscal 24 levels, and net profit growth in single digits. So in my concluding remarks, 
Um, and as I said, for Biocon as a group, fiscal 24 has been a year characterized by both significant operational successes and clear progress in preparation for future growth opportunities across our businesses, while at the same time facing and addressing a range of operational and market challenges, which I've described in my commentary. On balance, we've made good progress. Two very important elements of fiscal 24 have been the traction seen in our base businesses and the progress made on investments to underpin near-term growth. For generics, these include the manufacturing capacity investments, primarily for formulations and peptides in Visag, in Bengaluru, and in our Hyderabad sites, as well as the acquisition of the oral solid dose facility in the United States. In biosimilars, we've made investments towards capacity enhancements of our Malaysia insulin facility to ensure we can meet the increasing demand we are seeing right across the global markets. We are also realizing the benefit of past investments to meet increased demand for our monoclonal antibody portfolio. And in Syngene, we've had the acquisition of the Stellis Biologics facilities which adds the substantial biologics drug substance capacity and a commercial scale high-speed fill finish unit. Sinjin also acquired the genome land in Hyderabad, as I mentioned, to support the longer term growth in our discovery research services. These investments on top of the existing base businesses um, uh, and opportunities uh, and our new product flow put the businesses in a good position to capitalize and deliver on the market opportunities ahead. So looking to fiscal 25, we expect it to be a year of both consolidation and of transitional and accelerating growth. Consolidation will build off the recent business model expansions and capacity and capability evolutions we've invested in behind our businesses. Transitional accelerating growth will come from revenue, building off these enhanced models that will start modestly and pick up in the second half of the year, driven by growth from existing products and existing markets, supported by accelerating growth from existing products and new markets, and of course, from new growth from new product introductions into new markets. In generics, while we expect continued pressure on the API business, given the current business environment, we also expect growth driven by formulations, especially new formulation launches in the second half of the fiscal. Transition and acceleration in the generics business will come from the new flow of GLP opportunities with the impact becoming visible in fiscal, 20, in fiscal 26. In biosimilars, our base business is expected to deliver robust volume growth through its strengthened vertical model and expanded global footprint. Favorable FDA inspections of our biologics facilities in Malaysia and Bengaluru would be key transition events, subject, of course, to agency review and decision. With any favorable outcomes would likely have limited impact in fiscal 25, with more material impact uh, in 26. For Syngene, the long-term demand drivers for the sector are positive, and with the expected recovery in US biotech funding, Syngene is very well positioned to capitalize on demand recovery across research, but also from the tailwinds in the biomanufacturing uh, division and the fallout from the US Biosecurity Act, which will gradually accelerate the China plus one uh, opportunity. Overall, Biocon group companies have strengthened business models with greater global reach and scale and are increasingly well positioned to take advantage of significant and emerging market growth opportunities. With this, I would now like to open the floor uh, to questions. Thank you, Peter. I'll request people to use the Zoom application icon to raise their hands. We will wait a, bit, uh, wait a while for the queue to assemble.
We will take the first question from the Demanti Karai from HSBC. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you for the opportunity. So my first question is on your commercial uh, biosimilars in the US. So good pickup seen in all the three products, uh, Ogibri, Fulfilla, and Simgli. So uh, it appears that uh, upcoming launches are uh, will most likely make a meaningful impact uh, a year later from now, or whether it's Bevacizumab uh, or Aspart or other uh, biosimilars. So just want to understand in the commercial biosimilars, what kind of uh, further headroom you see for growth and uh, how, uh, how should we uh, see this uh, biosimilar growth trajectory from 1 billion mark? Thank you, Damiati, for the question. I'll um, start with a, with a, with a, with my response, but perhaps uh, Shri Hass and Matt can add into this. I, I think first of all, I, you know, we're very pleased with the mem with the momentum we're seeing. Only two quarters out from taking the business over in the United States, we're seeing some very robust market share increases. These, are, of course, are driven you know, by volume demand for our products, um, you know, and, and they are coming along, uh, you know, with some pressures on pricing. But, uh, you know, we see sustained uh, demand in, in, uh, in, in volume for our products, I think, both in, in the private and the government sectors. And I think we see that coming across our full uh, range of uh, products in, in market today. And I would also comment that I think you're right, Damiati, that I think the, the new product launches, while they could have some impact in this fiscal, you know, the, the, the major impact would be seen in fiscal 26. Shri has maybe you want to build upon that and, and Matt probably with some details on the in-market demand profile in the United States in particular. Shri has? Are you on mute? I'm happy, uh, Peter, if you can hear me. Back, I'm happy back, to chime back, in. Back, yeah. back, perhaps you can pick up on that. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for that. And thank you for the question. Uh, look, I, what, what we're seeing in, is it really the ability to understand in the U.S. the Part D side and Part B in our portfolio. And we're building upon this through this relentless focus we have not only with our sales team, but building those relationships with market access. So we're building on the foundation and setting ourselves up for a nice portfolio in oncology, diabetes, and even immunology as we prepare to launch new products as we go into latter half of FY25 and then continue to set us for success in FY26. Um, maybe we have Shriyas now, but th those are my thoughts there, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, Shriyas, did you want to add anything? I think Shriyas may be struggling with, with the technology. Um, so, okay. uh, Damiani, does, does that yeah, answer uh, your question? Yeah, yeah it does. Uh, thanks for it. Uh, my second question is on uh, your progress in efforts to gain market access and fair coverage for Adalimumab. So you basically commented uh, the market will notably start opening up in uh, calendar year 2025 uh, or maybe a bit later. So meanwhile, maybe you can just update us on your effort uh, on the fair coverage side. Sure. Um, I, 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 let me start again. I mean, I, I'll repeat that, you know, Adalimumab for Biocon Biologics has been, you know, a, a, a real success story, as you can see from our positions in Europe. You know, we're going to look to build on that experience in the United States. Um, and as I said in my commentary, we, we don't really see the market opening up in calendar 24, but, you know, we'll see it begin to open up more materially in, in 25 as as formularies take the originator off their off their lists, and we will be working, you know, to establish our foothold as that opens up, and then build from there toward a stronger position through Canada Twenty Five. Matt, uh, again, maybe you can comment a little bit more on the channel details and, and and the model on that, and our strengths that we're putting putting to work. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, we're seeing the. Still, the, the foothold of Humira that's still on most of the formularies. As Peter stated in the opening remarks and just stated too, this will start opening up in 1125. 
what we've been able to do is secure some positions within our market access team in re regards to having not only Humira, but having the biosimilars on there. So as the payers start to transition Humira off, we will start using our sales force to start pulling that start pulling our products through to increase that market share. The other thing I will say is that we're, we have tremendous relationships. As you know, we've been working market access uh, since we launched our products in 2018. So the payers are very familiar with Biocon. We are aggressively pursuing these opportunities and we do see some opportunities lifting and we'll be in position in 1125 uh, to be able to take those advantages in which the payers decide. Thank you. I'll get back in the UQ. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Devanti. We'll take the next question from Janil Shah from JM Financial. Hello. Yeah, hi. Am I audible? Yes, you are, Janil. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my first question is on Denozumab. Um, so, you know, the, you know, uh, Sandoz has settled with the innovator and, you know, do you believe that we will be in the first wave of launches, um, cause we'll be filing by the end of this year. So what are your thoughts on that? Yes. As I said, in my opening remarks, you know, I, I, we think we will, um, you know, and we're delighted to have secured that opportunity and, you know, are working as you'd imagine toward that, uh, very aggressively. And again, this is an opportunity where we can put some of our existing, uh, you know, capabilities and strengths to work in, in, in that market. Uh, and again, perhaps, um, Matt, you'd like to pick up on that uh, and and maybe on, on the regulatory status as well. I think we have Srihas available. I see him. Srihas, are you able to? I think Srihas has a technical problem getting sound off. Yeah, we can't hear you, Srihas. Matt, this is Sandeep. If, if I yes, Sandeep, that, that would be helpful. Thank you, Sandeep. Yes. Yes, no, certainly. I mean, uh, I can confirm that uh, we are in a good position to make the filings in the next few months. And we will be in the first cohort that can launch in the US and Europe as well. Sure, sure. And um, any timelines for approval uh, for both uh, Denos Maps, Stellara, and any risks that you see to the those timelines? I think our package uh, looks good. The data is looking fine. I think I'm very optimistic in terms of uh, going through the approval. Um, it takes regular regular cycle is about 12 months for the FDA and about 15 months with the clock stop for EMA. So that will be standard as expected for all the molecules. Sure. And um, just one on uh, the CAPEX that we are planning for the next two to three years. Let me let me take that. Um, <clears throat> I, I think that what you will see is that capex will taper down, uh, calibrate down from from recent levels, but we will be maintaining the necessary investments to support the capacities that we're building uh, to uh, you know underpin both the existing near term growth opportunities and the mid term opportunities that we are moving toward. So uh, you'll see us, you know, some calibration down, but we are not um, going to going to stop investing behind the very substantial near term, uh, mid and longer term opportunities that we've been building towards over the last few years. Sure, and just one more, if I may, um, you know, in the generics business, uh, you know, what's our uh, growth guidance and how many launches do we? expect next year you know we have alluded to to edge being stronger but if you can give us some uh you know uh, guidance on how many launches are there how do we expect wizard to start contributing so your thoughts sure um i'll ask it to to provide more detail but uh, you know again i'll comment that uh, you know what we are looking at is you know, transitional acceleration, and we see that picking up in the second half of, of, of this fiscal, built on the, the, the new product launches, especially in formulations, you know, that we've invested in over the last years, and we've 
as I said in my commentary, we've made a large number of, um, of, of regulatory submissions. We've had good success in approvals, and we expect to see that momentum continue. And that will underpin the growth that, that we'll be looking for in the generic business over fiscal 25. Sid, do you want to add anything more to that? I think the only optics uh, which I would like to give is, of course, this is a, a combination of uh, products that we have filed in the U.S., which includes a uh, few injectables and few OSDs, which are either approved by the FDA and uh, waiting for launch, uh, or they are under final review with the FDA and uh, we will launch uh, during the course of the year. Plus, uh, uh, as uh, we mentioned earlier, that Lira Glutide in UK will be launched uh, by our partner Zentiva and by us uh, by end of this calendar year. And our file is also in uh, advanced stages of review with uh, European authorities. And once we uh, receive those approvals, uh, that uh, product would be launched as well uh, in the second half of uh, this fiscal year. So combination of uh, uh, the launch in launch of uh, Lira Glutide in UK and Europe, uh, plus a few products in the US uh, will drive that growth. Uh, I cannot give you exact number of uh, products, but needless to say, our portfolio continues to be limited in terms of uh, total number. Uh, but of course, these are differentiated high value products uh, that we are working on. Sure. Thanks. Uh, Thank you, just, just checking yeah. if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yes, now, we can hear. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Apologies for for this. Which... Sure. Janil. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Janil. Uh, we'll take the next question from Surya Patra from Philip Capital. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for this opportunity, sir. Uh, my first question is on the uh, biosimilar business. So having seen strong volume growth in the uh, recent quarters uh, for the already marketed products, uh, the the base business or the like to buy growth in the biosimilars looks either muted or, uh, or declining on the for FI24 uh, versus last year. Uh, so given that uh, and uh, the kind of a price competition, although there is kind of volume ramp up that is visible, so, and also likely a ramp up in the key products in FI26. So, what growth one should really think for the biosimilar portfolio in FI25? So, Surya, I'll again um, begin, but Shri has maybe um, now you're online, which is good. We can we can get your view. Yeah. Surya, I, I I think that you know I. That there's strong momentum in the in-market products in the biosimilars business. I mean, as I've said in my opening remarks, you know, this includes uh, market share gains and not in substantial market share gains across all our products in the United States. You know, robust market share performance in the in the quarter that we transitioned the business in the United States, leading market shares in many instances in in Europe and the highest ever quarter that we've seen in the emerging markets business. So I think there's very positive growth momentum in the biosimilars business, you know, and I, you know, we would expect that growth momentum to continue during fiscal 24. Um, you know, Matt's given some comments on some elements of that, but, uh, you know, we've seen extremely robust demand for our products and that's reflected in very high volume pickup in, in, in the last two quarters of the prior fiscal, and we expect that momentum to, to push through in, in, to, into this fiscal. So I, I, I don't quite see the, the, the market um, starting point as, as you described. I think we're building off a very encouraging momentum and we'd look to see that push on through. Srihas, perhaps you can put a little bit more color on that. Uh, pretty comprehensive, Peter. I just say, Surya, that if you look at the uh, products that we've got in the market in the United States, which is a very large market, each of those products now command um, a, a fifth of the market share, a fourth to a fifth. And I think um, that is something which will clearly demonstrate that we've um, uh, we've got a sizable piece of the opportunity there. In Europe, you're seeing us uh, move 
uh, from the two country approach that we had in the past uh, to be to the, the other countries, the other large countries in Europe and emerging markets, Peter just talked about um, the strong response we are seeing from uh, key emerging markets. The, uh, the current immediate uh, focus is with the, the products that are commercial. But if you want to look at how things are shaping up in the in the near term future, that will be on the back of new product launches. Uh, we talked about two in the opening remarks, and uh, we also have the uh, the risk free launches that we're looking at uh, from new products uh, in two major geographies. So I would think it's a it's a very strong uh, you know expectation in terms of how we are moving things forward. We have good momentum, and we expect to drive this in the years to come. Sure, sir. Uh, second question is on the, let's say, about Humira to be specific and uh, the pipeline products, uh, including the Ustia Likijo map. So uh, starting with the Humira, so uh, uh, see, in fact, we have seen Humira has uh, seen some kind of a revenue decline in the recent quarters, uh, but that has not translated to any kind of improvement in for biosimilars. So is that mean Humira is losing out business to some competing products? And if that is the case, whether biosimilar opportunity is likely to be, will it to be shrinking for Adalidumab? Shriash, do you want to pick up on that? I think we've covered some of it, but... Um... Yeah, uh, thanks, Peter. I think, Sula, that's a very fair question. Just to, um, just to index this properly, Adalidumab in the US was the first product that... Um, that in that sense saw biosimilars coming up in the in what the US market calls as the pharmacy benefit space or the part D space. And uh, that operates very differently than the previously launched products that we have seen in the oncology space. So to understand that space a little bit different than, than how the oncology product, which are more buy and will operate. So this was, I think, in many ways uh, for all the players, including the payers and the PBMs, to to understand how this opportunity unravels itself. And I think what we've seen is that everyone's tried to understand how a twenty billion dollar asset eventually plays out. And like Peter mentioned in his opening comments, we'd always said that twenty three is when it may open up, but it will only begin in twenty four, and some meaningful progress on the biosimilars will only happen in 2025. And I think we're probably seeing that starting to happen in 24, where you're seeing one or two uh, biosimilars players starting to get some market share through some innovative models that the PBMs have come up with. Mm -hmm. And uh, 23 essentially was where the innovator continued to hold uh, more than 98% of the market. Um, now, this is uh, something that was a first experience for everyone in the pharmacy benefit space for such a large asset. Stellara will, of course, play out uh, uh, following this. There will be some learnings of this, uh, including things like product attributes, including um, interchangeability, including ability to negotiate. All of this will help uh, the industry, the, the biosimilar players, as well as the PBMs to, uh, to help shape this as we go forward, uh, Surya. Okay, sir. Uh, just last clarification from my side, sir. In fact, about uh, the marketing uh, arrangement, what we had with the Viatris at the time of acquisition of the uh, biosimilar business in US, uh, whether uh, when we are saying that we have now integrated ourselves, uh, so whether that marketing arrangement is effective for FI25 that is there or not. And secondly, about R&D spend, Fourth quarter have seen some kind of moderation uh, uh, to the around eight percent of the uh, uh, revenues, excluding of uh, Sinjin. So whether it is the kind of fair run rate that one should build for next year? Let me let me start with that. Um, so uh, maybe I'll start with the second question first on on R and D. As I said in my remarks, uh, in Syria. I think you'll see a cal uh, uh, as, as you've identified at a, you know in Q4 a calibration down from previous levels, but, but th this is in part due to the cyclical nature of of where assets sit in our R and D and particularly the development pipeline, 
you know, it, it is not a constant spend. It does um, modulate as you move assets from early stage and into later stage development, which is more expensive. So there's a natural um, <clears throat> curve there. But the other comment I want to make is we are going to continue to invest behind building a very globally competitive pipeline of assets. And that has been something that Biocon Biologics committed to many years ago, and it's, and it's a theme that we're going to uh, persist with. We, we're very confident ab about you know, our ability to build uh, a, a very competitive global pipeline that will serve you know, our, growth, um, uh, our growth aspirations in the mid and the longer term. And as I said also, we, you know, we now have you know, a, a very exciting and visible flow of, of new products on, on the near-term horizon. Sure. I'm sorry, sorry, your first question was? Marketing arrangement. What oh, mar had. marketing arrangement. Yes, no, I, I think there, but I'm going to ask Sri has to, 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 to comment as well. The, the marketing arrangements um, with Beatrice have now all successfully completed and the handover is complete. We have no, no lasting marketing arrangements left. In terms of marketing and commercial capability, obviously, uh, within that uh, within that transaction with the address, we we've got some great people that have come over and joined Biocon Biologics, and their expertise, their capabilities are helping underpin, you know, the the very exciting growth momentum that we're seeing in these early quarters as we complete, uh, you know, the full transaction. But just to, to be clear, Surya, on this one, there are no marketing arrangements left here. There may be some very small peripheral support activities related more to uh, administration, but there are no um, marketing uh, legacy uh, contractual remains here. This is now fully the Biocon Biologics team driving this momentum. Okay, sure. So will this uh, lead to a kind of some absolute increase in the either employee cost or or, or uh, any other cost element for us? I mean, the short answer to that is, is yes, because in the previous um, collaboration model with Viatris, they had those costs, but of course, they took a lot of the profit as well. So now we have those costs and, you know, you will have seen that reflected in, in some of last year's numbers. So we're now carrying the cost of, of that commercial marketing team and, and activity, but we're capturing now the full value of those efforts. And it's, as I said, very encouraging to see, you know, the, the market share gains and the momentum building. And we're capturing all of the value now in this fully vertically integrated uh, model. Oh, Shri, has, do you want to add anything to that? No, no, Peter, I think you covered it well. Perfect. Yeah, okay. sure. Yeah, thank, sure. You, thank you. Thanks a lot. Wish you all the best. Sir. Thank you, Surya. Uh, we'll take the next question from Neha Manpuria from Bank of America. Yeah, thanks for taking my question. Uh, you know, just to follow up on um, the Humira, uh, you know, the biosimilar Humira that we talked about, um, you know, the two private label launches that we've seen by the biosimilar companies seem to be gaining, uh, you know, good traction, at least that's what the initial data seems to show. Um, uh, you know, so as we talk about the market opening up in 2025, does that put our ability to then get in and get meaningful share at risk, uh, you know, with these existing players probably scaling up over the second, over the next few, um, you know, months? No, yeah, I think it's a, a very interesting question. Uh, it, it, it is one that the, the team, uh, you know, have been looking at for some time and I think are advancing our own thinking on that. You know, not 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 simply for Humira, but but beyond. Um, I'm going to ask Matt here to 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 comment a little bit more on that and uh, perhaps develop a little bit our thinking there. Sure, and I'll I'll let Trias please chime in as well. So you're you're correct. We're seeing the private labels st um, starting to migrate, and reason is is that recently CVS announced that they were transitioning from Humira. And remember, as we look at this, we look at a commercial piece, we look at Medicare, Medicaid, there's multiple channels. And also there's 
two other large commercial entities that's available to play in which we are bidding now for 1-1 one, one start dates. So just as we're seeing these private labels migrate, that does not leave all the market out for Biocon. The market is open in the commercial, in the Medicare, in the Medicaid business. So we are actively and set up and pursuing those opportunities. And we're also keeping a close eye and understanding how the private label and how that's switching uh, and the progress there. But we still believe we have an opportunity in which we're currently bidding on for more growth in FY25 starting in 1125. But anything, Shreyas, you would like to add? No, perfect, Matt. I think this is good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. That's very helpful. And my second question is, um, yeah, Peter, you mentioned in your opening remarks that, you know, debt reduction remains a priority for the company. Um, you know, given that a lot of the launches are going to be uh, back-ended uh, with bulk of the benefit in FY26, how should we think about net debt reduction for, uh, you know, BBL and Biocon uh, in the next year? I mean, what avenues uh, are we looking at to reduce debt? Uh, right. and, or if you could give any number, or, or that would be great. Right. Um, so, Naya, let me start by saying that, you know, we are, while debt reduction, as I said in my opening remarks, is a priority, we're comfortable with our ability to service all our obligations. Um, we will be looking to reduce debt. And as you've seen in the last fiscal, we allocated $250 million to um, acquisition related debt reduction. Uh, you know, we have a, a pretty extensive range of uh, options and we are going to explore all of them and we'll look to make the right decision at the right time on that. But, uh, you know, we have um, bank opportunities, we have equity opportunities, we have hybrid opportunities. There are, you know, a, a pretty extensive range of levers that we can look at and we are exploring um, and we will make debt reductions during the course of this year. But we'll do them, you know, uh, I think at the right time and I can't give any specific quantitative guidance on that. But, uh, you know, for sure you'll be updated as and when, you know, we, 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 um, we, we become active there. Got it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Neha. Uh, we'll take the next question from Ankush Mahajan from Axis Securities. Thank you, sir. So my question is, uh, uh, what's the uh, outlook for the debt on, sir? Uh, was, was that question, what's the outlook on debt? Yes, sir. Outlook on debt. Okay, Ankush. Um, <laughs> Uh, as, as I've as I've said, I think that the starting point here is to understand that we are comfortable in servicing the debt um, that we have, but we're also, as a priority, going to be looking to reduce the debt levels, and uh, and we have you know a wide range of options to explore. Uh, as I've said, we can look at bank options on, on debt, we can look at equity options, we can look at hybrid options, there are other levers. Um, we are exploring that, we will, we will be looking to reduce debt this year, but I can't give details of when and how much, you know, we'll be looking to make the, 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 those decisions as appropriate during the year, and of course, we'll, we'll be updating you as and when we do. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, we take the next question from Nitin Agarwa from Dam Capital. Two questions. Uh, on, on the US, uh, now, when do you uh, what are you thinking about the approval for the US market for GLP one? I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear that question. Where are we on the approval for GLP one in the US market? Oh. Nathan's okay. question. So. so, why did you take that? Yeah, so the file is under review uh, with the FDA, and uh, <clears throat> we are quite positive that uh, we should hear back uh, from the FDA. Of course, 
This uh, requires a facility inspection as well uh, because this uh, product was filed from Biocon Biologics injectable facility and as Peter alluded to in his opening comment that uh, we are expecting uh, FDA to inspect the facility in the coming uh, uh, months. And hopefully, uh, you know, when when they uh, when they come to review the facility, inspect the facilities, uh, you know, they will look at it for liraglutide as well. So, you know, it's, uh, we ex I think Peter also alluded to the fact that we expect uh, liraglutide to meaningfully start contributing to the growth from FI twenty six, and uh, you know, even uh, if the approval comes through. Uh, later part of this year, uh, we will see a meaningful difference uh, coming in from both now Europe and US in the FI26. Thanks. And secondly, uh, if you can provide some clarity, uh, some color on how is the immunosuppressant new facility scaling up? What kind of capacity utilization do we have and, and how do we see that part progressing? So the capacities, uh, you know, the existing capacities, of course, we have done a lot of uh, process optimization to enhance the capacity while we qualify Vizac, uh, and again, uh, as you know, that uh, we have got the CEP from the European authorities, so we can already start commercializing part of those quantity uh, capacities in Europe. But of course, uh, for us, the bigger market is US and Latin America, and we are expecting FDA to come and inspect the facility, after which we will be able to address uh, the demand. Of course, uh, when you look at our current facility and Vizac, we'll have a huge uh, opportunity to capture a much larger market share for immunosuppressants uh, at a global level. And so that with, with your capacity of the increased scale coming through, do you foresee a, a situation of uh, increased sort of pricing competition in this space? Uh, I mean, is there demand there to absorb such a large capacity uh, that we're going to bring on board? Well, the demand is growing because the volume share is going up. Now, of course, there is competitive pressure. There are, uh, whether it's uh, from rest of the world or India, and in some cases, uh, other companies who has their own immunosuppressant fermentation capacities. Uh, so <clears throat> we're also working with a lot of 505 B2s. As you know, that uh, we have a very large customer, uh, which is based out of US. They have their own 505 B2. So, and overall, when we look at the uh, the immunosuppressants market, it's expected to grow. So we, of course, have to uh, participate in the market uh, going up and uh, compete with others on the market share and winning additional business. I think last quarter, we also got a very important approval in China for mycophenolic uh, sodium. And we also have other immunosuppressants which are, in, uh, which are under review with the Chinese uh, authorities. And China, as you know, is also a large volume market. So we would look at geographical expansion. We would look at increasing our wallet share in the our core markets like US and Latin America. And overall, the market uh, is growing up as number of transplants go up. Thank you so much. That's a lot. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your questions. Uh, that was the last question of the day, given the timelines we are at. Uh, for the questions that will remain unanswered, I'll request the participants to please send us an email and we'll be happy to you know, take them offline. With this, uh, we'll conclude uh, today's presentation. I thank every one of you for joining us today and have a great rest of the evening. Good night. Thank you.